So open up with me to James chapter 4 this morning. And I'm just going to get right to it. Um, in chapter 4, James is going to continue what he has begun, and that of pointing out the reality that uh, true Christianity, those whose lives have been justly described as we saw last week in James chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, and as was here evidenced today through the giving of the testimony of three lives, will and do look differently from the unsaved living from the people in the world around them. So I wanted to just back up briefly where we were looking last week in James 3, verses 17 and 18. It's James is there teaching at the end of chapter 3 on the differences between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom, ungodly wisdom, as that which was earthly and natural and demonic. We see in 3.17, he said, but the wisdom from above, meaning the wisdom that comes from God, is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and one of the things that James has been pointing us to the entire book of James, is especially from chapter 2, 14 and following, is that of good fruits. Genuine faith is unwavering. We know in whom we have believed. And it's without hypocrisy. This is what wisdom looks like that comes from God, that comes from heaven. And if you remember in verse 13, James says, who among you is wise and understanding? How many among you are actually starting to understand, James is saying, what I've been teaching you with regard to faith without works being a dead faith, a non-saving faith? Are you starting to allow this to sink in? He said there in verse 18, that the, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those who make peace are living in stark contrast to those who are not making peace for God. Remember in verse 16, we back up one verse, we see that people living according to worldly wisdom, where that is, there's jealousy and there's selfish ambition that leads to disorder and every evil thing. We saw that very clearly, and if you... I don't know how else to say that, but there's a huge difference. There's a big difference. It's not even close. The, the lives of which James is articulating and, and defining here. So after instructing us last week about how the wisdom of God that comes from above is intended to be that which defines the very character and nature of the true child of God, he again here in chapter 4, beginning in chapter 4, is calling us, calling the the brethren there, he referred to them as brethren, the 12 tribes who were dispersed abroad. He says, you need to, again, he's calling them to examine their very living, examine their lives with regard to the kind of wisdom that you're living according to. Is it from above or is it earthly? And the kind of fruit that we're talking about is just your everyday life. The fruit of everyday living. So, let's look at chapter 4 together beginning in verse 1. He again opens up with a very personal question. He says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? This is the complete contrast of those whose lives, as we just saw, would be that which makes for peace. Lives that are defined and the nature of the heart that's defined as wisdom that comes from above is contrasted here with those who are living according to worldly wisdom. Lives that are full of quarreling and, and conflicts. And you see right there it says, among you. Here in this context, this indicates that these combative relationships were between people making a claim to be the children of God because they were meeting together in the house of God. These again were the twelve tribes dispersed abroad to whom James is writing his letter. And James has already indicated that he doesn't believe 
that all of those to whom he is writing has a personal, intimate, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. He's already clearly indicated that. And he's saying that among those who are gathering amongst God's people, there are some among you who have quarrels and conflicts. Quarrels is from a Greek word, polemos, from which we get our English word polemics. So it has the idea of prolonged disputes, if you will, a war, a, a war of words. Conflicts is from a Greek term that is used to describe warfare and specific battles. So it, it portrays the severe nature of the war of words that are going on amongst those that are among you. James uses terms here that indicate the significant strife that's happening within the personal relationships among those so-called believers. But notice again his question. What's he specifically asking? He's asking if they understand what the source of all this is. What's the source of these quarrels and conflicts? You have quarrels and conflicts among you, but do you understand what the source of those things are? And so then at the very end of verse 1, he just jumps in and he tells them. He says, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Pleasures, right here, is a word in the Greek that um, we get our English word hedonism from. It's the Greek word hedonon. We get the cognates hedonist or hedonism, which in its simplest form describes the pursuit of pleasure, which is what all people do. People are hedonist at their core. They seek pleasure in life. We just heard testimony of individuals who said that very thing. Now, again, pursuing pleasure isn't all that bad, is it? Not at all. As long as your greatest pleasure in life is the pursuit of knowing the person of God and showing forth the glory of His great name. Whenever God becomes your greatest desire, seeking pleasure in God is the, is the smartest thing a person could ever do. But that clearly isn't the desire of those to whom James is writing, is it? So the source of their conflict is a heart that is seeking pleasure apart from God. Listen to this passage from 2 Timothy 3, 1-5. through Paul writes to Timothy, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And again, kind of linking this with pleasures. What's the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? It's your pleasures. It's an unconverted heart. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. We heard that one mentioned today, did we not? Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, which is clearly a fruit of the Spirit. Brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness clinging to it desperately, although they have denied its power. And what was Paul's admonition to Timothy for the church over which Timothy was pastoring? Why? Why such a strong statement on how to handle such individuals? Avoid such men as these. It seems to be because they're claiming, see right here, holding the form of godliness, they're claiming to be God's children. They're saying one thing. They are saying what James said last two, two weeks ago was absolutely impossible. James says, is it possible from the same source to come both fresh water and bitter water? And the answer was a clear resounding no. Not only is it not capable, it's impossible but these individuals are doggedly clinging to that and trying to find a way to make that true. And so they 
cling to a form of godliness, but they live however they so desire, and they deny the power of a genuine relationship with God. Avoid these people. They're a danger within the church. They're the propagators of what James referred to as wisdom that comes from the devil. He says avoid them. James said clearly in 3.15, that kind of wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, it's natural, it's demonic. And so he admonishes them to not so lie against the truth. The truth of the reality is, is that the gospel changes lives for good. Because God does something that no man can do at a heart level. Amen? This is what James has been articulating over and over and over again and again and again. And did you notice the severity of the attack of your pleasures against oneself? What's the source? The source is yourself. And notice what it, he says it does right here. That, what? Watch this. Watch this. That wage war in you that impacts the members of a body. But it's waging war within you. In other words, your pleasures do not want to be told that what you are doing is perhaps sinful and selfish and that you need to stop it and repent. Self-pleasures don't like hearing that. They're actually offended by that. And so they still doggedly claim to a form of religion, though they know they're going to continue to deny the power of it. And they're offended that you would even insinuate, as James has been doing since chapter 2, verse 14, that that kind of faith is not a saving faith. And so it goes to war. Waging war in the Greek means to wage war. It's really deep. The Gnostics of James' day did not want to be told that their sinful behavior was going to keep them out of heaven, so they go to war against anyone who gets in their way. A war of words within the church, and it brings division and every sort of evil thing. That's what James has been teaching us here. Now in verse 2, James is going to show us the fruit of such sinful pleasures that these who are going to war to be able to maintain the lifestyle that they want to live, though they've denied the power of it. He shows the severity of that in verse 2. He says, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. Wow, I mean... Is this to be taken in a literal sense? Were there those among the twelve tribes who were dispersed abroad? Were there some things that deviously happening within the church? Or was this simply one of those ideas that Jesus says if you have hatred in your heart towards your brother, you've, you've in essence murdered him, you're a murderer in that regard, kind of elevating the spirit of the law? I'm not certain which way to go on that, but it seems that He's clearly indicating that the lusts that they have to secure their own pleasures, to do what they want to do, and yet still claim to be a true child of God, leads to such rancor that perhaps some very devious things were indeed happening amongst the brethren. Now, while this seems kind of stark and kind of really far out there, uh, do you think this has ever happened before in the church of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Without question. He says, he goes on, he says, you're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. This is what you do. And he says, you do not have because you do not ask. 
It's almost as if James is saying that this is the proof that the person who's claiming one thing, denying the power thereof, is not actually being guided by godly wisdom that comes down from above, but is instead being guided from earthly or natural or demonic wisdom because they're so intent on preserving their precious. And then he affirms that, in essence, in verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Again, it's almost as if James is saying the little prayer life that you do have, you spend your time asking God to bless you for the sole purpose of maximizing your personal pleasure. Kind of reminds me of a health and wealth gospel. Oh, dear God, bless this business adventure because it could be so awesome and it would make me rich and I could spend it on my pleasures. But I'm going to give to you, God. Kind of reminds me a little bit of that. He says those are wrong motives. You're simply trying to get God to affirm and maximize your own desires, your own pleasures. Again, a sure indication that verse 14, that there is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. A sure indication that you are living according again Chapter 3, verse 14, according to earthly wisdom. Not wisdom that comes from above. Wisdom that is peaceable. That bears good fruit. That's unwavering. So again, notice how James speaks very plainly about this reality in verse 4. He is very clear, very direct, and leaves no room for those straw men arguments that might try to be raised up to claim that indeed bitter and fresh water can come from the same source. Look at verse 4. He hits the nail squarely on the head. You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It doesn't get much harsher than this, does it? Adulteresses, spiritual infidelity. James is saying to those who want to claim faith in Christ all the while living for their own pleasures and even hoping that God might bless their hedonistic desires, James says you're no better than an unfaithful wife. How can you still not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. James says here that friendship with the world is spiritual infidelity. The world being the, the man-centered, Satan-directed system of this present age which is hostile to God and God's people. The spirit of the age. Or we could simply say it's earthly, it's natural, it's demonic wisdom. And the goal of the world is Always self-glory, self-fulfillment, self-indulgence, self-satisfaction, self-pleasures. Self is the name of the game. Listen to how the Apostle John kind of articulates this very same thing in John chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. There he says it this way, he says, Do not love the world. Again, that same system that's antithetical to everything of Christ and His kingdom, nor the things. So he gets a little bit more personal. He goes from, from preaching to meddling. Or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of, of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So according to both James and John, friendship with the world system that feeds man's pleasures is an easy indication that one might make observation of within themselves of the fact that the love of the Father is not in them. It's clear, yet again, that James is trying his best to get unsaved people who think they are saved to look at the true nature and condition of their own heart so that by looking they might notice that they are people who still are in need of real change. Genuine repentance. 
a genuine faith. James is waxing eloquently on this and has been for over a chapter and a half. And as I mentioned last week, one of the most difficult things to do, as James is here trying to do, is to get truly unconverted people who believe they are saved to come to the recognition that they are not saved because their lives give living proof that they know not the living God. Because in their mind, they're good. They know all the answers. Went there, done that. I could repeat it to you. I even walked an aisle. I got baptized as a kid too. I know what it says. You can't trick me. James is doing everything he can. And think about this. Nothing new under the sun. This was written 2,000 years ago. And this is still a hot potato within the church today. People within the church for the last 2,000 years have been inflicted with demonic theology that says, and this is the devil's bidding, by the way, that you can come to faith in Jesus Christ and still live however you want. No life change makes no difference, and you're still going to heaven. you got the streets of gold and not the flames of hell. That's been going on for 2,000 years. Read James. Don't believe me. Read James. Be the Berean. Go back to the Scriptures. Study the words. Keep them in context. You will see without equivocation that's exactly what James has been hammering on for a chapter and a half. So that people he knows of the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad could wake up and see. Did we hear some testimonies up here this morning that maybe kind of reiterate that very theme? I'm thinking very specifically of Landon House. And as I sat over here listening to Landon House, I had tears welling up in my eyes because his testimony was so in line with mine. I was an unsaved, saved person who thought he had fire insurance and was going to heaven no matter what I did. And I did it with a fistful of dollars. As fast and furious as I could. But I was good. And I could give you every biblical answer because I got drugged to church for so many years. I had heard it so many times. I know the right answers to say. I was polite with the adults. I knew what to do. James is pleading for those individuals like me to wake up and see. And how you wake up and see is you look in the mirror of Scripture and what do the Scriptures say? Not what do you feel. What do the Scriptures say? And go with that. And if you don't see in your life what you see in the Scriptures, forget making straw men. Punt them. They've led you astray this long. Forget about it. Go with the Word of God. Repent. And follow after Jesus. Amen? Because again, notice the end of verse 4. James is not stuttering. If you wish to be a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. And I've had people try to make straw men in front of me to where enemies of God are actually disciples of Jesus Christ. That you can be both. That from the same source, both fresh water and bitter water can, fl can flow. And they deny the very truth of what James was teaching us at the end of chapter 2. Where he is showing that is absolutely impossible. Because when God comes to reside within the heart of a man... It's not just by whim. He gives them a new heart. And with that new heart comes new desires and new affections. And you didn't have anything to do with it. And once you get it, you can't shake it. And once you get it, you know it. Because no longer are you chasing after the pleasures. Pleasures, we're talking about what's the source, the quarrels, money. It's your pleasures. You're no longer chasing after your own pleasures. You have new desires. You have new pleasures. Where did they come from? I've never had these thoughts or feelings before ever in my entire life. Where did the desire to be pleasing to God come from? 
And I used to get scared. Is it going to f- f- you know, f- fade away? Is it going to fleetingly just vanish and disappear? Will I go back to being the old Ben that I used to be? And it never, it never went away. They got stronger and stronger. And the affirmation that it was God who was at work in me to will and to work for His good pleasure was getting more, was getting more established. The assurance of my salvation was becoming more secure because I could see God at work in me. And it's a beautiful thing. A Godward life. You know the difference. You know, when you know, you know. And let me tell you, you know. You know. J.C. Ryle said it this way, true Christianity will cost a man the favor of the world. He must be content to be thought ill of by man if he pleases God. He must count it no strange thing to be mocked, ridiculed, slandered, persecuted, and even hated. But listen, when you're trying to be a friend of the world, these are the very things that you find a way to get around. You never get mocked, ridiculed, slandered, persecuted, or even hated for your faith. You find ways around those things because you're friends with the world. You have a foot in both. You want that and you want this. Bitter, fresh, same source. And you've convinced yourselves, these individuals had, that that is a okay. And James is saying, no, it's not. Wake up and check your spiritual pulse. Verse 5. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. Do you think that that is with no merit? James is here is reminding, reminding the twelve tribes that are dispersed abroad that God has a claim on them by virtue of His saving work in their lives if they're truly His. And once saved, God puts His Spirit to dwell in us and He is jealously desiring us, our spirit. That which is spoken of in Genesis 2.7, the Lord God formed man to the dust of the ground and breathed into His nostrils the Spirit of life. And in Exodus 34, 12 through 14, he says, Watch yourselves that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Don't become friends of the world into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. But rather, you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim. 4, verse 14, notice the jealousy of the Lord. For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. Have you forgotten that? Last week in Bible study at the house on Sunday night, Matthew Kerr dropped this one on us in relation to the book of James. And before, it, and before the prophet gets to this section in verse 23, God gives the reason for which he is doing this from 25 through 27. And it says in verse 23, it's for the holiness of His great name. For the holiness of the great name of God, this is why God is going to do this. I think James probably had this Ezekiel 36 passage in mind often as he was writing his right straw epistle. Listen to what God is doing for His chosen people both now in the church age under the new covenant and what God will do following the church age for the nation of Israel once the fullness of the Gentiles has come into the fold. This is one of those already not yet truths concerning the true people of God. Ezekiel 36, 25-27, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. 
And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. This, precious church, is what God Almighty is doing in our midst today and will continue to do once the church age has come to an end. Romans 11, when, all the, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then all Israel shall be saved. Listen, the gospel doesn't change. So let me ask you, who can stay the hand of God? Who can prevent God from doing this to those people whom He has called to be His own sons and daughters? Who can stay the hand of God? Who can say, no thank you God, I want heaven, not hell, but I don't want your new heart of flesh that would cause me to walk in your statutes and cause me to be careful to observe your, your word, your ordinances, your law. I don't want that portion, God. I just want the streets of gold. It doesn't work that way. And James literally is begging and pleading with these brethren to come to this recognition. James, once again, has clearly shown from 4.4 what dead faith looks like. People claiming faith, and James calls them adulteresses. And he calls them enemies of God. Friendliness and acceptance of the world, this world system that is hostile to God, is one of the surest evidences of not truly knowing the only true and living God. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. Now, I, th I thought about, and I'm keeping an eye on the clock on the wall back there, I thought about rehearsing for you the entire sermon from last week. Remember 13 through 18? Wasn't that awesome? So I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of it. Who among you is wise and understanding? We talked about how in the Hebrew culture, wisdom wasn't just esoteric, it wasn't philosophic, it was the life, life demonstration. You, you, you made notice of wise people because their lives were in accordance with God's Word and truth. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. James was saying, Who among you is wise? How many of you are truly understanding what I'm saying? If that's you, then show it by your good behavior and your deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. And then he comes right down here and he shows you what gentleness of wisdom looks like. It's wisdom that is from above. It's wisdom from heaven. It's pure. A pure lifestyle. Fleeing lust, lustful desires and inclinations. It's peaceable. We could walk through this entire list again. It's that which produces good fruits. It's unwavering. You stand strong. It's without hypocrisy. You're not claiming one thing and doing another. Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, in the gentleness of wisdom. And this is the wisdom that comes from above. And James said, and, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. When the Spirit of God becomes alive in the person, it's evidential life transformation. Because as we saw last time, wisdom that's not from above is wisdom that is from the earth. It's natural. He said it's demonic. And that's why he says it, it's when you see these things, it's the source of disorder and every evil thing. And that's why he says if, if, if you disagree with what James is saying, he's saying stop being arrogant and stop lying against the truth. I mean, James is, James is not pulling any punches. He desperately wants people to know Christ and to get saved. Amen? That's why I said to you last week, one of the hardest 
jobs that you will ever have is what James is doing, trying to convince people who think they are saved but they're not saved to recognize that they need to get saved. And then from their perspective, a second time. No, it'd be for the first time. That's the hard lifting that James is trying to accomplish. So in verse 6, wrapping us up for the day, notice this beautiful passage right here. James says, but he gives a greater grace. How am I going to accomplish all that God... It's all about God. He gives a greater grace. His yoke is light. Landon talked about trying to get you know, on the treadmill of performance of doing Christianity. It just wears you out and you keep going back to doing what you do. It's all about grace. He gives. Who gives it? Who gives grace? God gives grace. A greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God gives grace in abundance to the humble, to those truly lowly in heart, to those who truly recognize the error of their way, their way, their life, to those who see, they see how they have utterly sinned against a holy God and who in agreement with God's provision of grace in Christ Jesus alone turn from their sin through repentance and then turn to God in faith, knowing that His grace is able to truly set them free from a world of sin and death. And as such, God's greater grace is completely adequate to help the child of God to meet the requirements of walking according to His word. That his, jealously, that his jealousy imposed upon us at such a time as so great a salvation. Augustine said it this way, God gives what He demands. And if He demands a walk of obedience, this is why He gives a greater grace. And this is why He gives a new heart with new aspirations, new desires, new loves. God gives what He demands. So, listen, if you're here this morning, and I don't, I don't know the condition, the true condition of any man's heart, but I can watch your life. But if you're here this morning and you know not the power of this greater grace as evidenced by your heart, your life, your living, Indeed, you've heard of it, and perhaps you even agree with it, but you do not see God's power at work within you, causing you to will and work for His good pleasure. I would ask you to stop trying to reason yourself out of this spiritual quagmire that you have found yourself in on more than one occasion. Stop trying to find ways and excuses for such a glaring deficiency that God has promised to do to all who truly come to Him for the free forgiveness of sins and in true humility, turn to Him today. Remember what James said. God is opposed to the proud. Don't allow your pleasures to wage war within you this morning and to convince you that, you can, that you're still okay. and You can still do and live how you want to live and do. But God gives grace to the humble. Repent and believe today. Today is a day of salvation. Let's pray.